Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. We'll get going now. Um, my name is Paul Golan. I'm executive director of the Society for Humanistic Judaism, and I'm honored to be joined by our guest, Stuart Milk, who is the co-founder and executive chair of the Harvey Milk Foundation. And co-hosting with me is Jamie Krass, who's director of youth programs at Keshet for LGBTQ equality in Jewish life. And I'm going to hand it to Jamie in a moment, who will introduce the work of Keshet, and then Jamie will turn it over to Stuart. But first, I want to provide a little context to why we at Society for Humanistic Judaism wanted to have this conversation. Uh, for those of you who are joining us live, there is a chat function on this webinar, and we encourage you to write any questions you have in the chat, and we'll do our best at the end to get to your questions, but um, Jamie and I have some questions and we're going to uh, ask Stuart those as we go. But for a bit of context, I'm actually wearing two hats for this webinar. And one of them is an initiative we have called Jews for a Secular Democracy. And this is a political initiative, but I feel like if we are going to celebrate the legacy of Harvey Milk, we're gonna get political. And what Jews for Secular Democracy is, is an initiative around the separation of church and state through a Jewish lens. And it is a pluralistic Jewish lens, meaning we want to bring the full spectrum of Jewish identity to the defense of the separation of church and state. And we very much see LGBTQ equality as a church state separation issue or a religious freedom issue because it is generally just a fundamentalist religious approach that is driving all of this awful, frankly, hateful legislation uh, against the LGBTQ community. So we wanted to, and this is why we wanted to talk to um, Stuart and the Milk Foundation and bring Keshet into this conversation as well. The Society for Humanistic Judaism is not pluralistic. We are a denomination of American Jewry, and therefore, by definition, we don't represent multiple viewpoints. We have a specific viewpoint that we bring to our Jewish identity, and that viewpoint is secular. We are humanists, and I will welcome you to be in touch with me separately if you've never heard of that and you want to talk about that. That's not the point of tonight's webinar, but we also wanted to celebrate Harvey Milk's legacy because we named Harvey Milk the Society for Humanistic Judaism's uh, humanistic Jewish role model of 2022 to 2023. And those of you who are not members or donors to SHA missed our most recent magazine, but I wanted to share the cover with you. We celebrated him in our quarterly and um, our communities around North America, many of them are our congregation hosted programs where they discuss his legacy or they watch the theatrical release of the film or the documentary where they read about him. And, and we did a, a bunch of programming locally. And this is an opportunity to have a conversation um, for folks across, really across the globe about what Harvey Milk meant. And so I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk both about his own approach to Jewish identity as someone who seemed to identify as a cultural, not religious Jew, but also the political piece, which I think Jews of all expressions can, can get behind. So those are the two hats I'm wearing, and I'm very happy to now ask Jamie, to introduce a bit about yourself and Kesha before going to to Stuart. Thank you so much, Paul. And it's a it is so meaningful to be here tonight. Um, Stuart, I have chills right now just being in your presence. This is the first time we're ever meeting, and I have to tell you that when I was first coming out to myself at probably at the age of thirteen, I remember Googling you know, being Jewish and gay. Is this a thing? And um, and Harvey Milk was one of the first results that came up and the Harvey Milk Foundation was one of the first results that came up. And that was such a comfort to me. And even in the moment, I don't think I realized what a comfort it was. But as I have grown up and lived my full true self, 
um, I've realized how much of an anchor that was to me. So it's really wonderful to be here with you. And so, so grateful to be a part of this evening. So a quick little snippet about Keshet and myself. So my name is Jamie Kress. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the National Director of Youth Programs at Keshet, which, as Paul mentioned, is a national organization that works for the full equality of LGBTQ Jews and our families in Jewish life. And our work takes multiple shapes, but we can uh, we can break it down into at least three different angles. One of those angles is community mobilization. So we support grassroots and national campaigns that forward LGBTQ rights here in the U.S. Um, another angle is through education and training. Uh, so that means meeting communities where they're at, whether they are day schools, JCCs, federations, day camps, overnight camps, what have you, and bringing them along a journey towards fostering deeper LGBTQ belonging within their communities through lasting institutional change, inspired by in-depth training and education with their communities. And then the third, my favorite, is uh, through youth programs. So this means we work with about 1,200 LGBTQ Jewish um, youth between the ages of 13 and 24 throughout the U.S. as well as in, as in Canada and several other countries um, on providing them with opportunities to create community building programs for each other to engage in deep, meaningful leadership development, to engage in Jewish learning, um, to participate in immersive experiences, weekend retreats, which we call Shabbatonim or Shabbaton in the singular, um, and to provide them with opportunities to kind of come into a greater sense of knowing their own power. So that's just a snippet of, of what Keshet is and what we're about. And now, Stuart, I would love to ask you our first question, which is, for everyone here, can you please tell us a bit about your work, how the Harvey Milk Foundation started, and what its goals are? Sure. Um, well, first of all, it's great to be with you and Paul. Um, and um, <clears throat> I guess the 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 founding of the Harvey Milk Foundation um, was uh, really at a question that Desmond Tutu asked me at the White House. Um, I was there to accept the posthumous award for my uncle. Um, Kara Kennedy was there to accept the award for her father, um, uh, uh, Ted Kennedy, um, but uh, he was alive, but he was too sick to go. And everyone else was there accepting the award themselves. It was a real surreal moment. And there's a time when you're alone with the awardees um, and the president, President Obama and Michelle Obama, and that's it. There's no staff. And, and Desmond Tutu took that moment to turn. I was sitting next to Kara Kennedy, and he said, Kara, I love what you do for the Robert F. Kennedy Foundation, for your uncle, and for the John F. Kennedy Foundation, your other uncle. And then he turned to me and he said, Stuart, where is the Harvey Milk Foundation? And he said, you know, I know that you've, you're out and that you've spoken about these issues, but there needs to be a Harvey Milk Foundation. So I kind of, at that moment, channeled my uncle and I said, well, will you help? And he said yes, and Sidney Portier said yes, and Nancy Brinker said yes. And so, and, and, and he had been for the, our first 10 years, our chair of our board. Um, but that was really the inspiration. He said there needs to be a foundation. And he said that, you know, he really said that, you know, your role having the name um, and Kara, and he said, turned to Kara and said, Kara, talk to Stuart about why having that same name and having that blood connection means so much for people. And so, you know, that was really the, the, um, the start of the Milk Foundation. And then, um, you know, I, I told our initial board and ongoing boards that really the focus needs to be global because I, I firmly, from my early work um, uh, as, a, um, as a younger man, um, was always around global issues of equality and justice. And so um, uh, I, can, I can also give you one brief story about, you know, uh, about my activism myself. Um, when I, I was 17 when my uncle was killed, uh, assassinated, um, and that's when I came out. Um, he had told everyone in San Francisco that I was gay, and he never broached that subject with me. He simply said to me when I told him that I felt different from everyone, he said, you and your differences is the medicine that the world needs. He gave me a book, Seven Arrows, with inscribed with it, you and your differences is the medicine that the world needs. And even when the world doesn't recognize that, it was a really very powerful 
or he gave me that book when I was 14. It was really very powerful and I got it. And, um, but when I started working in the, uh, after I came out, uh, I was 18 when I started to try to do some work in the LGBT community and some pretty famous um, LGBT pioneers um, who had embraced me in school in Washington, DC, like Frank Kameny. They, every time I spoke, they compared me to Harvey. And, um, and Frank, I don't know if people know who Frank Kameny is, hopefully you do, he's kind of a historic figure, but uh, you know, Frank actually said, oh, you're nothing like your uncle <laughs> when I would speak. So. I actually went into the women's rights movement because um, and started working for now in the National uh, Women's Political Caucus on the Equal Rights Amendment. So I got to go to the closing conference for the UN Decade for Women in Nairobi, Kenya in 1985. I was 25. And, um, and I met a woman named Lilla Watson, and that's really what informs the work that we do. So just briefly about Lilla, she began this conference, and to this day, it was still the conference that I, the only conference that I've been at where people felt so self-important. I mean, first of all, I was in Africa, and most of the people had my color skin, and um, and most and the majority were men. It was the closing conference for the. Uh, for the Decade for Women of the United Nations, and Lilla got up to open the conference. She could barely fit above the podium, and this little Aboriginal leader from Australia began the conference by saying, look, if you've come here because you want to support women, um, if you've come here because you want to help Indigenous people, if you come here because you want to help, um, uh, you want to help people of color, pack up your bags, go home. We have nothing to do together. And you could hear a dead silence. You could hear a pin drop in that room and mouths open. And she said, let me repeat that. If your role is to help women or people of color or indigenous people, pack up your bags and go home. And she let that silence hang there. And then she said, but if you understand that your liberation is bound with mine, then let us work together. And she went on to describe the importance of doing work from an altruistic, not from an altruistic viewpoint, but from a self-interest viewpoint. That when any of us are marginalized, diminished, or discriminated against, that puts you at risk personally. And, um, and so that really informs the work of the foundation um, because we do feel that when anyone is not treated equally or fairly, anywhere, and it really ties into kind of my uncle's own impact of being, you know, a young man um, uh, impacted um, by World War II and what happened in World War II and his belief in the Jewish phrase of, you know, of never again, but his belief of never again is for anybody, not never again for Jews but never again to any community that's marginalized, any community that's a minority, any community that can face the tyranny of a misguided majority. So, you know, so, so the work of the Milk Foundation is, um, is to, uh, we don't do anything without them. So we don't go any place unless we've been invited or we feel, or someone feels, or a community feels that we can assist. And we usually, you know, it's kind of, there's a great, video that the audience could uh, Google Harvey Milk and Juana it was my uncle's last TV interview where, you know, the interviewer said, well, we tried to have this, this one and that one and we couldn't find anyone and you are who we found. And she, Harvey said, I know you couldn't find anyone else. So you have me. Let's talk about the issues. So we usually are the call. We usually get the call when everyone else has turned uh, folks down. And, and to be honest with you, there's no place that we have not been willing to go where we've been asked to go. And, um, and the Milk Foundation will continue to work um, with um, not LGBTQ communities and our allies globally, regardless of the legal uh, parameters that they are in. In fact, you know, I'll be leaving you know, to, to go to some nations in um, South America and the Caribbean where uh, old colonial laws still criminalize and uh, stigmatize LGBTQ people. That's you know, as you describe it, I'm really thinking about everything I'm reading about Harvey Milk's um, political career as being focused on um, many different communities. You know, it wasn't that he was 
there just to serve the LGBT community. His political rise was about reaching out to a, a wide spectrum of different people who are marginalized or minorities. But you did mention the Jewish piece. And so I did want to ask about, you know, he certainly didn't shy away from acknowledging his Jewish background. Do you have a sense of how that informed his identity and his politics and his work and, and life? Yeah, like I said, it was huge. I mean, it was it was so um, I, kind of the patriarch of the Milk family when um, my uncle and my father were younger and um, and into his early adulthood was um, uh, Morris Milk. Morris founded a synagogue in Woodmere. He also founded a dry goods store that, in fact, you know. In uh, probably a decade or longer ago, if I was up in New York and someone would see the name Milk, I would, and they would say, "Oh, are you related?" And I would say, "Oh, you mean to Harvey?" They said, "No, to Milk's department store." So um, it was, it was, it, and he. Uh, to be interest, interesting to note that the department store actually burned down. Uh, it was uh, it was torched. It was set on fire because uh, Morris would bring together. There was a Hindu population there. There was a, a, a Jamaican population, and he would bring together all these different groups to talk about shared issues. And it, that really apparently went against the grain of some members of the community. And and the um, and the department store was 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 torched. Wow. But um, Morris was you know. So it was really my uncle, not so much my father, who would tell me stories about Morris. And, and they were very religious, obviously. Um, he founded the Sons of Israel Temple um, in, uh, in Woodmere, uh, Morris. But Morris had a phrase, um, which is, don't hide your green hair. They can see it anyway. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, my brother never kind of got that, but I got it right away, you know, because my brother would say, well, I don't have green hair. <laughs> and, um, but it was, don't hide your authenticity. People can see it anyway. If people are going to dislike you, they're going to dislike you for a reason. So it was really interesting. I think Harvey, you know, if you look at his political career, when he would, go, you know, and, and he was, you know, never afraid to, to lecture people. Um, he, he wanted to convince people and to change their mind. I remember when he first started running for office for his first um, election campaign, um, he sent me a letter that he had gone into a church and a thousand people hated him before he walked in. And when he left, 998 people hated him. Now, when I got that letter, Phone calls were expensive. They were only on the landline. And, but I called him and I said, Harvey, I got this letter. I don't understand. You sound excited that you left a place and 998 people hated you. And he said, no, I left a place where two people didn't and those two who did before. And those two will become four and the four will become eight and the eight will become 16. He said, this is the change that we need to make. So he was never afraid to go to places and to talk to communities. He believed so, and I think, you know, anyone who's seen, who's seen um, the documentary in particular, but also the Sean Penn movie, Milk, I think you understand that my uncle realized that it was the invisibility of the LGBTQ community that was holding us back. He firmly believed that if people saw us, knew us intimately, that the lies and myths and innuendos of about us would disappear. And he said, you know, that that was our biggest stumbling block. I mean, you know, his his only LGBT pride parade that he got as an elected official, because as you know, he was assassinated um, in his, um, uh, you know, in his first year in office, but his only LGBTQ uh, pride parade, he was thrilled to death that there was one openly gay doctor and two openly gay lawyers. I mean, he was ecstatic. He was like on the news, we had a doctor and we had two lawyers. But that was the situation back then when he was running. And by the way, um, the, your audience should know that is the situation today in a majority of the world, when I say a majority of the world, where the majority of the world's population resides. So it's still a tremendous visibility issue, especially when we're criminalized or when there's no societal acceptance. Um, so uh, Paul, uh, uh, his um, Jewish roots, I think informed everything that my 
uncle did. Um, right. and, I, and I absolutely believe that he saw the connection between, um, between what the Jewish di diaspora around the world um, has at it, as its um, calling as a result of World War II and as a result of the Holocaust and, um, and took that and I think combined it to, to reach out to other marginalized communities, including LGBTQ people. Right, yeah, and I think that interplay is very much at the root of why there is overwhelming support in the Jewish community for LGBTQ equality. It's not 100%, I wish it was, but it's, it's higher than any other um, religious group or ethnic group, and I think it's the experience of, um, it's the minority experience, it's the empathy. I think there's a lot of factors, and, and Jamie, I wanted to kind of turn it to you also around how the interplay between um, Jewish values informs Keshet's work for LGBTQ inclusion. Thank you so much for asking. And wow, Stuart, what a, what a journey. It is, I'm just basking in everything that you are sharing here with us today. So when it comes to our work at Keshet, um, Jewish values are texts and traditions. Queer and trans people, LGBTQ people have always been a part of Jewish tradition, have always been engaging with and a part of Jewish texts. It's just that we have not been visible and celebrated, acknowledged, and affirmed the way in the ways that we deserve, if at all. And in many cases, it was the opposite, erased and invisible, but always a part. And so when we hold that to be true, um, and we and we allow Jewish values and text and tradition to be an anchor and be a source of inspiration for all of us in this work, in whatever flavor meets us where we're at in our own experiences and in our own journeys, that makes this work stronger. Um, I would say it is Jewish to care about LGBTQ people and LGBTQ rights. And that is a, that is a belief that is upheld by Kesha and is expressed through the many ways that we do this work that I described earlier. Um, and we could get into specifics about what kind of Jewish values. We actually have several resources, um, two of which come to mind. One is seven Jewish values for LGBTQ belonging, and the other is seven Jewish values for um, social action. And some of these values include B'Tselem Elohim, this notion that we learn in the very first book of the Torah, in the first chapter, that the first human being was created in the image of God. And when we think about what that means, whether or not we believe in a God character or whether, we're not, or whether or not we believe in the divine, this notion that holiness is, is integral and it is um, natural, a natural part of being human. What does it mean to treat someone as though they are holy? What does it mean to treat someone with the utmost dignity and respect all the time? That's one example of the ways that, that Jewish values, our texts and our tradition can strengthen this work, work that resonates, like you said, Paul, not just within the Jewish community, but across the board with many different communities and populations that this, we, I think at the core, I really do believe, and maybe I'm echoing and Frank a little bit here, but I really do believe that people are good at heart. And it's just that we do the best we can with the light we can see with. And sometimes that light is very dim. And it's really about us really enabling each other to see what's, what's ahead. And I think Jewish values, texts and, and different kinds of traditions can help us do that. I want to get at the flip side of that, though, and ask Stuart, and I want to kind of articulate this with some sensitivity, but there is a tension that I want to acknowledge about religion and LGBTQ equality. I mean, um, Harvey Milk never lived to see openly gay rabbis. That was, you know, that was not yet, the, you know, the community was not yet there. The community was not yet ordaining openly LGBTQ people. We've come a long way, but there is still this tension and there has been a lot of hurt um, by organized religion, obviously over the centuries, but even continuing to today. And so obviously it, being Jewish, you can have a cultural identity, a heritage, a history, but um, what do you, how do you get at that um, tension around religion and do, do you address that at all in your work, Stuart? And, and how do you, you know, what do you think the attitude was for Harvey Milk? And, and do you think it's changed at all today? Well, I think religion, organized religion. Um, so let's separate organized religion from, from spirituality and, and, um, and 
some elements of religious dogma. Um, uh, I, I kind of um, buy into or would agree with Jamie's um, prescription that I think people, for instance, I think parents want to love their children. You know, I, I, our, the work that we did with Senator Ron Portman um, is an example of that. When he was completely against uh, marriage equality, when he was completely against LGBTQ rights, and then we worked um, with him and his staff, his son came out with him and he did a complete reversal. Um, I want to support my child. And he actually got up on the floor and said, I want to support my child. I want him to have the same rights as everyone else. And therefore, I'm reversing my stand on all these issues. Um, so much so that when we hosted for the first time an LGBTQ forum at the Munich Security Conference, the first time they ever had that at that meeting of global leaders, Senator Portman came over to describe that change. So um, I believe that that's part of the, I, th I believe that's part of the, um, of the challenge um, that we have with the religious community is to, um, is to find a way to, uh, to realize that embracing and supporting the full diversity of their communities, their families, um, is the only way that they can really fulfill their, their, their full potential. Um, I think we've seen a sea change in some elements of the religious community in some countries where, um, you know, uh, where they see the expansion of their, I'm, I'm not using this in a derogatory term, but their, of their franchise, of their, uh, <laughs> of their institution is dependent on them not excluding people. And so, um, you know, when, when LGBT, LGB in particular, should be LGBT, but Q, but LGB is so, um, and marriage equality did this, is so, has such a high acceptance level in the US. When I say that, people know so many people and marriage equality really did that. And by the way, Many of those marriage uh, equality marriages were done in religious institutions that were open and affirming. But you know, it's interesting. It really is the connection between my uncle's message of visibility. You don't go to a tolerance ceremony. You go to a celebration of people and who they are. Not I'm tolerating this couple who's getting married, but I'm going to celebrate them. And you know, I always talk about these first weddings that I've been to all over the world. Uh, one that really stood out was in Montevideo, Uruguay. It was their first, they invited me to please come over for their first marriage equality. This is, you know, a decade ago. And, um, and I remember just watching some of these people in the room like this, you know, that were there grudgingly. And then after a few glasses of champagne and some crazy dancing, they were like, oh, you know what, <laughs> let's live and let live. I mean, it really does open things up. And I think, you know, that, that, that many, religious institutions. The Mormon church is another example where they, now they're not on board with marriage equality, but they, you know, when, when the mayor of Salt Lake City wanted to rename the main street in Salt Lake City as Harvey Milk Boulevard, the Mormon church said, we're all for it. Um, you know, that's a pretty big stance from a church that had funded um, the work on Prop 8 in California. They, they were one of the main funders to stop equality. And they, you know, they, they were the ones who proposed the very strong non-discrimination law that in housing and in, um, and in uh, uh, public um, uh, access um, in Utah. The Mormon church actually helped write that law. And part of that was because they had dialogue with people in our community, and they also didn't want to start losing families in their congregation. So, um, so I believe that we should have dialogue with all of these religious organizations. I do not, you know, one of the things that we do at the foundation, if there is, you know, I, I kind of mirror my uncle, you know, he went into a place where he knew a thousand people wouldn't like him. And he wanted to go in there because he felt that we had to have dialogue there. So I think it's important that we do that, that we continue to do that. You know, one of the things that we wanted to do in the Jewish community that, you know, we had reached out, we never got very far, but when yeshiva decided that it was more important to keep LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ club from their student population, that that keeping it 
was more so when the Supreme Court refused to reverse the, the court's decision that forced them if, if they had clubs to allow the LGBTQ people meet, meet the, the board of yeshiva decided it was more important to keep that from people and decided to do away with all clubs. And I think that, you know, that we needed to have a dialogue um, and to, you know, and to reach out to, to, to institutions that continue to take these actions. We see today, um, not just in Florida, not just in Tennessee, but we see in places like California, we have two school boards um, this week, um, Telemuca uh, and Glendale, which based in LA County that have decided, uh, Glendale voted not to have a pride in their, uh, not to allow pride. Um, and Telemuca decided not to honor the state's curriculum on LGBT inclusion. And it's being driven by people who see themselves as defending quote unquote religion. Um, I don't see that many mainstream organized um, religions backing that. I see more fringe elements of organized religions backing that. But I think it's time that we continue to have that dialogue um, and that we point out what my uncle, you know, again, if you go back to that same video, if you want to hear, it's interesting, you know, if you want to hear my uncle talk about religion and LGBTQ rights, um, just go back, Google that Juana and Harvey Milk interview. Um, he talks about, um, about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ's teaching. It's interesting, you know, this secular Jew talking, telling people about what Jesus Christ believed, but he really asked people to pick up their Bibles in this interview and says, let's go through what, what, what it really says, both the Old Testament and the New Testament about, um, about LGBTQ people and about people in general. So um, my uncle believed in having that dialogue, not just simply saying, you know, these people are way off or they, you know, or they're bigots. Um, he was not a big name caller. Um, he was someone who believed in that in his own power of persuasion and um, and wanted to um, to talk with people and and move them. And um, and he believed that their life would be better if they didn't have all that hatred towards not just LGBTQ people, but towards anyone. I'm going to go find that interview and maybe we'll include it when we when we send a follow up email to folks, because what you're describing, I think, is basically how certainly liberal Judaism, but other liberal religions also are now accommodating LGBTQ inclusion is by reinterpreting the you know, it's the same word, but you can interpret it differently. And Judaism has been doing that, obviously, for 3000 years. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that the approach that Kesha takes to address the, the potential tensions there between traditional religion and LGBTQ equality? In terms of engaging with interpretations of our traditions and of our yeah. texts? Yes, and but also, how do you acknowledge the tension that I think is real for a lot of folks in the LGBT community who felt very hurt because they grew up in a community that told them that they were less than, um, and that it was God who was saying so, not them as, as people? Keshet's origin um, has its roots in the very painful reality that when Keshet was founded uh, about 22 years ago, 22, 23 years ago, it was founded because countless LGBTQ Jews were disengaging from Jewish life for that exact reason, uh, because they were feeling invisible, erased, because they were not feeling affirmed by the Jewish community, because even text and tradition was being weaponized against LGBTQ people, which is not something that is unique to the Jewish community by any means. And so Kesha was created as an opportunity for LGBTQ Jews to continue engaging in Jewish life but in a way that actually accepts who we are and, and our full belongings. And specifically, when, look, when we look at the origins, um, Stuart, I appreciated your emphasis of the LGB piece because that was that was the focus. It was almost as though the T and the Q were completely unfathom, unfathomable and invisible to the majority of the Jewish communities that Kesha was engaging was engaging with in its earlier days. And I think even today, like you said, we've, we see so much more acceptance when it comes to LGB folks. And not and and pretty intense hostile resistance and and 
uh, delegitimization of trans experiences and gender expansive experiences. So the way that Kesha navigates this is again by really onboarding everyone to the notion that it that queer identity, trans identities are a part of the Jewish community, deserve to be cherished, celebrated, centered, affirmed within the Jewish community, should have always been because we have always been a part. And so a part of it is onboarding that. And sometimes there is that very real tension of how do you engage with the tradition? How do you hold and celebrate belonging to a community that has and still does um, engage in whether it's discourse or interpretations of text that delegitimize who you are and undermine your existence? And I think at the crux of it, that's what it means to be Jewish. You know, when we look at uh, us being the at the Hebrew word Yisrael being referred to the entire Jewish people, the core of that, the crux of that story is wrestling with God. What does it mean to wrestle with God, with, in, in theory, the end and beginning of all things, with the ultimate divine? And I think we wrestle with human experience. We wrestle with our tradition, with each other, with um, our own evolving ideologies and our engagements with the world. Like this is, to me, that is what it means to be Jewish. It is both it is Jewish to wrestle and it is Jewish to center and forward and promote LGBTQ rights and belonging and collective liberation for all. So that is a that's how that's kind of how we approach it. And that tension is there. And our goal is to meet people at that table instead of approaching the table and just bombarding. We really meet you there and then bring you along um, towards that deeper understanding and familiarity. I love also that we mentioned that we were talking a little bit about the Mormon Church, the Mormon Church publicly expressed support for the Respect for Marriage Act this past fall, which is a massive step and, and quite unexpected for a lot of folks. And for me, um, as a Jewish person and as someone who's deeply ingrained in this work, and I'd love to hear your takes on it too, if you're willing to share, I felt a deep sense of hope and belief that hearts can change. Uh, it's not just minds that can change, but hearts can change. Um, and it can take a long time. But as we learned from Dr. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And that was a moment where I felt like I could finally see the bend in an arc that otherwise looked like a flat line for, in some ways, for a long time. And, yeah. and that's a, one of my favorite quotes. Um, uh, but um, I love, uh, so one of the people who, who worked with us with the foundation and helped us was John Lewis. And so John Lewis uh, added, added to that quote um, that, the mar that the arch of the moral universe bends but bends, bends very slowly, but bends towards justice. And he would say, and it takes people, it takes us to bend it. Um, and you know, that's kind of very much like my uncle's, the us's, um, that, um, that we have to continue to do the work. Um, and um, you know, I, 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 I think that you can embrace um, religious organizations that move forward and in a kind way, um, but in a steady way, challenge them to do more. So in the case of um, the Mormon church, I mean, one of the things that we did when the Mormon ch church supported the, um, the renaming of their big six boulevard to Harvey Milk Boulevard was to challenge the church to also um, uh, work with a um, uh, women rights pioneer because you know, um, the thing that we heard from so many members, former members of the Mormon church was that more stigmatized than LGBTQ people were women in the church who are not wow. to this day allowed to have leadership roles, who are to this day are not accepted into senior positions and are not considered, you know, uh, founders of the, of the church. So it's important that we keep that intersectionality going. Um, so as we embrace and recognize, and I think that there is a celebration of people moving forward. Um, we also have to remind people of the work that still needs to be done. You know, one of the, my great concerns is when we see um, <clears throat> um, certain members of the LG community who have been um, embraced and accepted, um, who will, you know, see injustice towards other minority communities and, and are willing to say nothing. And it's really, really important that we continue to speak out and that we challenge our, our, um, our uh, community members to realize that that, you know, that, that uh, march forward can take us two steps back. Um, and, um, and the two steps back could include them. It goes back to that Lilla Watson quote that you know that our liberation is bound together and that um, and that we should be doing this not because it's the right thing to do 
but because our liberation is bound together. Uh, one of the things that I learned in this kind of year long dive that our movement has done on Harvey Milk's legacy was how impactful he was in just the, the 10 months that he was in office because it was at a moment in time when um, progress that had been made legally was being overturned by proposition and that in California, a right wing politician uh, initiated uh, Prop, Prop 6, I think, and um, the initial opinion polls show that it was going to pass for sure, and Harvey Milk went way beyond San Francisco to the whole state, and not single-handedly, but had a tremendous impact on turning public opinion, and it didn't, it didn't pass. So, and that was a, a huge success, but I have to say, and I really appreciate the answers that you're giving that are hopeful, but in, in looking at the footage and seeing the rhetoric that was used almost 50 years ago, it's now the, it's shifted a little bit um, to, to trans more than, than gay and lesbian, but it's the same excuses about protecting children, right? The, the proposition was they wanted to fire any op openly gay or lesbian teachers and anyone who supported gay rights from public schools in California. And even Ronald Reagan said, this is gonna be a violation of constitutional privacy. You know, at a certain point, there was enough momentum where Reagan he himself actually said, you know, this isn't gonna work. But um, what is your hopes for moving forward in the future in the US? And then there was another question, which we'll get to international, but in the US, like we're, we're having, it gets me down to see the same rhetoric. How, how do we, uh, you've given a, a little bit about it. Is there, is there other things that we can be doing to move these folks past where they are? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, education um, and that um, dialogue and, you know, uh, uh, keeping people, you, I mean, we can feel comfortable in the silos, but you have to get outside of the silos. Um, and it's really important to do that. Um, uh, the, you know, the, I know you wanted to separate U.S. from international, but there's really a connection. So, you know, when we see Vladimir Putin say, you know, I have, you know, before the Sochi Olympics, I have nothing wrong with LGBTQ people, but leave the children alone. Or in Poland, where you have Duda saying, you know, we should have LGBTQ free zones because of the children, or Marie Le Pen in France, um, or Viktor Uban in, uh, you know, in Hungary, who will stand on the shores of the Danube, right? where we have a remembrance of a tragedy and of one of, you know, one of a community's worst reactions to the Holocaust um, uh, with the, the shoes all, and, and, and says who actually he's, you know, he's got a shopping list. So on the shopping list is very similar to my uncle talking about Anita Bryan's shopping list back in those days, you know, his shopping list, um, Duda, Marie Le Pen, uh, Victor Ubin are Jews, P Roma people, which are the people of color in Hungary and the LGBTQ community, but he will stand on the shores and say, who wants your children? And he says, the gays, and lesbians want your children. And so that rhetoric continues. Um, and, um, and I, you know, it, I, I, when, I'm, when I'm abroad and getting ready to go abroad, you know, one of the questions I'm always asked is when does the battle for justice and equality come to an end? You know, when do we clear it? And, um, you know, and one of the things that I can take with me that's old to these places that I go, like France and Rome and, uh, and uh, Turkey, that are much older than us here in the U.S., is I take this people's constitution with me. It's the oldest living constitution. And the, one of the writers of that constitution, Thomas Jefferson, when he was challenged by Lafayette about slavery, um, uh, in, in response to questions about his conversation with Lafayette about our treatment of Africans who were brought to this country and, and were still enslaved, he said that the battle for, you know, he was asked, when does this battle for equality and justice end? And Jefferson's famous answer is, doesn't have an ending. Um, 
that the battle for equality and justice requires vigilance. And whenever you have people subject to the tyranny of the majority, we must be vigilant. And there is not an end date. Now, all you have to do is ask our friends in the civil society community and the civil rights movement from other communities um, who have had so much more work and have had so much progress and so much back and forth. Ask them when the battle ends and they'll tell you it doesn't. And so this is part of the role that community leaders, that um, faith organizations hopefully who come on board um, and realize that, you know, that uh, justice and equality is universal and has tremendous interconnectedness, um, that this battle is, is, is one that humanity will have to keep going. Um, you know, I famously was, <laughs> uh, she may be watching, but one of the directors uh, from the Milk Foundation once asked me, oh, I just can't wait to no one has to come out. No one has to put on a label. We have to come out. We're a minority group that has to have that process. It's very individualized. There's not a set time. There's not a set place that that needs to happen. But, um, but we need to be able to have LGBTQ people recognize themselves in role models. We have to have a, a, an environment where they can have that difficult process. And if any of your audience um, is new to this dialogue, just ask someone that you in your life who's LGBTQ what their coming out story is. I guarantee you they'll be moved. I guarantee you they'll be impacted. And just asking the question is a green light to that person to be able to express themselves, to be able to take off any remnants of that mask that my uncle took those bullets to destroy so many years ago, and to actually let, as Jamie described it, their full authenticity come to display. Beautiful. You're on mute, Jamie. Do you wanna ask about a little bit about um, the next generation? I do, especially because I work so closely with them, but I am, again, just uh, just basking, Stuart. So there's a lot going on right now when it comes to LGBTQ rights, specifically in the US, um, everywhere. And I'm looking in, into the US, but also beyond, like you said, everyone's liberation is bound up in each other's and it's important we center that. So I'm curious, what do you think <clears throat> What do you think the future holds for our younger generations? Like, you know, for LGBTQ youth, what does it mean for, for, for well, I, I don't quite account as us, but what does it mean for LGBTQ youth to be the inheritors of Harvey Milk's legacy? Um, and what do you hope that connection will be? How do you hope they will express that legacy and that inheritance? Well, I mean, I think, I think, I, I think LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth, um, have tremendous opportunity in the United States, not everywhere in the world, but in the United States. I mean, I, you know, I, <laughs> I can really show my age when, um, you know, gay marriage wasn't even um, in our thought process when I came out. Um, me and my first boyfriend, we just didn't want to, we wanted to be left alone and to be able to live in peace and not fear about losing our job. Um, so, I mean, there's just tremendous opportunity right now. But lost in some of that is the struggle. Um, you know, there, there are young people who can't even remember the marriage equality battle, um, much less the, uh, the anti-sodomy laws and all of the stigmatization that we had in this country um, and that we continue to battle with. Um, and so I really do think education is a key. I think we have this tremendous body of elders in our community who could be teaching about the struggle, about where we've come, uh, about where we're going, and have important dialogue. Look, there are members of our community who disagree even on some basic progressive values about the LGBTQ community today. And I think we should have dialogue on that. Um, what, you know, For instance, I just saw you know, so, so another um, person who was with me at the White House in 2008, um, Billie Jean King say, you know, I'm not sure about transgender sports. Um, let's have a dialogue with her. Um, let's have a dialogue about this issue. I think it could help 
with the broader audience that they see that we're not, you know, we're not a community, we're a community that, you know, spans the spectrum of everything, where every race, where every um, ethnicity, where every nationality, where every religion, and where every political bias, we're from, you know, and Harvey said that in this one thing too, he said, you know, that nobody can speak for the LGBT community because we span everything. We're from the extreme right to the extreme left and everything in between. And so I think it's important that we put that face on and have that dialogue with ourselves. And I think that helps expand it out. And for youth in particular, I think um, uh, it's, it's really important that we um, hear what youth are asking. And I think it's important for youth to hear how those in our community who are elders are struggling to understand what they're asking. So as an example, um, in, in uh, February, I, was, I went to a coaling, uh, coal, we have a partner in the UK, um, wonderful organization that actually started um, LGBTQ History Months. And um, I went to Scotland with them and talked with in this mining town and their parents still remember, you know, the, the father was still in his mining gear. And he said, you know, I've got a, a transgender child who, you know, first I was to use one pronoun, then I was to use another pronoun. Now it's them and it. And he's like, look, I love my transgender child because I can't say son, I can't say daughter, and I'm just confused what to do. I want to to love my child, but I every time I do something, it seems like the, the goalpost has changed. And so, you know, I really felt for that father who, you know, this rough, um, uh, hardworking man who said, please help me understand. And so I think it's important. So, you know, what I said and what we worked out and what I left behind in Scotland was working with the youth council that they actually fund through their municipality um, who works on LGBTQ issues to have these dialogues. I think it's important for the kids to understand, for the youth to understand what the struggles may be. Um, and that the idea, you know, it's, it's, I love elements of faith. I love this, the Rumi quote, you know, out there between ideas of wrongdoing and right doing is the field where we will all meet. Um, you know, I, you know, that's, that, that, that to me is also very Harvey. He was in some ways like that mystical thing. Um, and I do believe that's where we will find our ability to move forward. Have to have um, that, um, that element of dialogue and listening. And so many of us are not good listeners. Um, and so it's really important to remind parents to listen and equally to remind our youth to listen. And then finally, I will just add that um, this is cross-cultural and universal. Um, our youth are still struggling. And we have to recognize that when I say our youth, I say in particular LGBTQ plus youth, because we are between two and four times likely to be um, to be more to to have suicidal ideation. Our LGBTQ youth are are two to three times more likely to be homeless than non LGBTQ youth, which means there's something going on in the home that's not right, either non acceptance or they're unwilling to, to stay in the family. And I do believe that keeping people in the family is important. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a wonderful um, program at the University of, of, uh, of California, San Francisco by Dr. Caitlin Ryan, which is the Family Acceptance Project. And by the way, um, it's something, I don't know if Jamie and Paul, you've looked at any of their resources, but they have religious specific resources on how to keep families together. Um, it may not create a utopia in the home, but it creates an environment where, where youth are not leaving that family unit and the family are not losing the potentiality that that youth would have offered uh, to grow that family. So I think, you know, this is a, a universal issue um, of LGBTQ youth, and it's really, really important that we look at all sides mm -hmm. I'm going to combine a couple of the questions that came in through the Q&A and then, and then we'll wrap up. So one of them was specific about Africa because, and, and wondering if you're doing work there as well, because there seem to be some particularly harsh 
governmental and religious entities in Africa. And then the other question, I think um, the door was open to this question um, when you talked about um, uh, how all of our uh, justice is intertwined was um, about Israel, Palestine and, and gay youth on both sides of the conflict, but also um, the conflict itself, I guess, is part of the question and whether that comes into it as well. Um, so I'll, I'll take the first uh, or the, the yeah, the first uh, question, um, which is, um, which I'm sorry, is, was Africa. Africa. Um, so yeah, I actually did Uganda Pride with the State Department last year. And it's really disappointing that um, uh, that Uganda went ahead and um, and not only passed um, uh, an archaic and um, and 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 tragic law that not only keeps LGBTQ people criminalized but punishable up to and including um, death um, uh, for just having a relationship. But um, I will tell you that. Um, that I've also met some of the activists in those countries. And so that's where the hope lies. Um, what we find, and you could actually go back to even here in the US, when a country is in that type of regressive environment, what you often find are a few standout individuals who are willing to speak out. Unfortunately, those individuals need community support. Um, and some of those individuals are caustic to, to working in communities. Um, they, and par, part of it is just the nature of kind of being this out front person, having the personality to do that. Um, and they become kind of lone wolves. So what we do in Africa and what we tried to do in Uganda was, and you know, the Uganda Pride event that we did at the U.S. Embassy in Kampala last year, um, you know, it was interesting. I asked how many people are LGBTQ, and you know, maybe out of a thousand people, there was one hand up. Although obviously they came there because they, you know, um, but but so you know, part of it is is to remind people in those environments. Um, and in countries like Africa, um, and I will, by the way, talk about Scott Lively. I, that may be where um, the questioner was going and groups like Scott Lively's. But um, uh, one of the elements is to remind people of, uh, and in particular in Uganda, and I would love to have talk, talk to the speaker of their parliament, who's a woman, and most of the parliamentarians are women. Um, most of the members of their lower house are women. Um, because when I'm in a group of people here in the US and abroad, I always ask whether it's LGBTQ or not, um, how many people here have someone in their family history that was legally discriminated against? Um, I just did a lecture um, at the London School of Economics. It was not an LGBTQ audience. And I said to this really esteemed group, of, of students and academics, I said, how many people here, you know, a thousand people, how many people here had someone in your family history, a grandparent, a great grandparent, a great grandparent who was legally discriminated against? Not a hand went up. I said, so there's no women in your family history? I mean, so we forget, I mean, so we have to tie these knots and we have to make these connections because they seem to constantly get lost. So it's really, really important um, uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to do that um, uh, connectiveness with people. And then the issue in Africa is, and, and, and in many ways, you know, we're, we, when I say we're driving it, um, uh, we have people like Scott Lively and organizations that represent a far right Christian viewpoint that have moved their operations out of the West and into places like Africa. They don't have an audience for that or much of an audience um, in the US anymore. And now they've exported it. And they do have a receptive audience in Africa. And I think that you know one of the things that I've challenged the government, our government, is um, they do get funding from our government. Um, and uh, it's very important that we you know, find ways to stop funding um, organizations that spread hatred and discrimination 
um, in other places across the across the globe. But Africa is a challenge, um, and it's really you know it's one of those things. So you know, someone said you know asked us have we ever been to and done work in Russia? And one of the reasons that we haven't is that we have this philosophy that we won't do anything without them. And if we have one person that invites us in, but the overall community doesn't want to be part of an of a freedom movement, then we don't go. Uh, we we want to be there to support a community, and there has to be a broader element of community than one person. And some of these countries, it is simply down to one person speaking out against it. Um, I applaud the the what the UK has done, um, what what both. Um, uh, the Liberal Party and the Tory Party have continued to do, which is to challenge African countries that are still part of the Commonwealth, uh, that they risk funding by passing these laws. Um, I wish that there was more one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And I think it's really important that we call out not just, you know, and we talk about the African continent and, you know, so we just have one of our major sports teams who just signed a pack with a government owned sports team in live of a country that criminalizes LGBTQ people with the death penalty. And, you know, and I, I you know, and I, I think sports teams have come a long way, but you know, how come we have this silence on, you know, on uh, the PGA combining with LIV when you have a track record like Saudi Arabia on not just LGBTQ rights, but women's rights, um, freedom of the press um, and oppressive, press, oppressive actions. I think that there is um, uh, really uh, a silence that is unfortunate today on issues like that. Getting our government not to fund stuff is something I feel like I could help uh, move our Jews for Secular Democracy initiative to, to help with. If other folks want to get involved with the work of the Milk Foundation and Kesha, can you let people, can you just tell them right now how they might be able to get involved in your work? Yeah, so the, the milkfoundation.org is our website. Um, we have um, we have a really talented team of mostly very strong, talented women, um, and their uh, phone numbers are also listed on our uh, website. Um, and um, uh, we 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 do most of our work, the majority of our work globally. Um, but um, but we would love to have people um, join in our efforts and uh, hear more about our work. Great. And on the Keshet, oh, sorry, and on the Keshet end, um, this is our website, keshetonline.org. Primarily, our work is focused on the on the U.S. and Canada, um, and there are exciting collaborations that we often engage in with other organizations that are international. Um, but this is where you can learn more about those community 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 mobilization, education and training, and like I said, my favorite youth empowerment and youth program work. Well, thank you both. This has been so helpful and, and educational, and I feel inspired, and I really want to um, follow up with both of you about how we can continue to, to do things together and how I can bring some, some folks to what you're doing. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you both for being here, and thank you for all of the attendees for being here, and um, have a great rest of your week. And thank you, Paul, for making this possible. Stuart, thank you so much for giving us this chance to ask you all our questions. There's so many more questions to ask you, but we're grateful for any time you were able to give us. Thanks, Paul and Jamie, for doing the work. And thank everybody um, who's on this call for, um, you know, for fulfilling my uncle's dream of uh, tomorrow filled with hope. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.